I'd like to welcome you all and thank you very much for coming to a breakfast. Uh, we're going to be addressed by two Englishmen, so I think it's appropriate um, uh, to congratulate them on a, a fabulous few weeks. Uh, <laughs> um, it was um, an Englishman who I think observed that the Americans had given two things to the world. One was barbaric and one was an enormous gift to civilization. The barbaric thing was the business breakfast. Um, <laughs> the civilized thing was the dry martini. Um, and you can cope with one with the other, um, which is another linkage, of course, because Philip Blonde is the half-brother of Daniel Craig, um, who is James Bond. Uh, <laughs> um, Kevin Andrews, Shadow Minister for Families, Housing and Human Services, uh, Susan Lee, Shadow Minister for Childcare and Early Childhood Learning, uh, Senator Maurice Payne, Shadow Minister for COAG, and Stuart Ayres, Member for Penrith. Uh, uh, I'm delighted to welcome you to this special event. P Professor Peter Shergold in conversation with Philip Blond to discuss the topic, Does Australia Need a Big Society? Before I start, I'd like to thank our host today, uh, Cause Chambers Wethgar, particularly the partner in charge, Robert Regan. Uh, I'd like to thank my fellow directors of the Menzies Research Centre, Tony McClellan, Paul Espy, Julian Lisa and May Kaur. And the centre is honoured by the presence here today of some of our long-time supporters. Uh, Patrick McClure, a leader in the third sector and an author of the seminal McClure Report on welfare reform. Donald MacDonald, uh, director of the Classification Board and, of course, former chairman of the ABC, and Trevor Rowe, uh, the chairman of Rothschild Australia. The Menzies Research Centre's aim is to bring together the best policy experts and practitioners with liberal politicians who are responsible, of course, for developing and implementing policies. We hope to make connections and provide ideas that people might not otherwise uh, get to put into the policy-making process and in, do, in so doing uh, contribute to public policy in Australia. Our program this year includes policy roundtables on defence and national security, foreign affairs and trade and small business, as well as panel lectures on environmental planning and contracting out of government services. More information about the centre's program is in the prospectus, which has got Robert Menzies on the cover and is on your seat, so please don't sit on him. Um, um, Please take them, have a look at the prospectus, and if you're so moved, please donate, uh, uh, because our, our work is entirely funded uh, by donations, uh, which have, as, as you'll read in the prospectus, the added benefit of tax deductibility. Uh, so any, uh, for every dollar you give us, Wayne Swan um, <laughs> is obliged to co-contribute. Um, Today's events wouldn't be possible without uh, the support we've received from CAUSE. And CAUSE has a long uh, tradition of recognising the importance of giving back to the community. Its giving back program includes providing pro bono legal services to not-profit organisations, as well as donating the time of its graduates to not-for-profit not not for legal refer referral service as part of their training. CAUSE staff uh, support of uh, 11 not-for-profit organisations through their program uh, is, is interesting because given Menzies Research Centre's tax deductibility status, it w could qualify, and why don't you add a 12th? <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully we won't need too many legal services. <laughs> um, as well as being a leading supporter of Australia's third sector, CAUSE people are leaders in their own field. Uh, for more than two decades, Robert Regan has been helping shape the legal landscape around construction in this country. He holds a number of management positions within the company and has been described by the Financial Review as one of Australia's best lawyers for infrastructure and construction. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Rod Robert Regan. Well, thank you, Tom. Distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure to welcome you into our office uh, this morning, especially on such a beautiful uh, Sydney morning. Uh, Tom, it is a, a dry breakfast, but there will be no dry martini served until 11. Uh, CAUSE is a premium independent Australian law firm, and we feel it's important that we contribute to discussion and debate on issues which affect our community. As a lawyer, I find it interesting to reflect on the role of government in society, 
and where the line should be drawn between government intervention and individual responsibility. Um, today's discussion involves some truly leading thinkers, and I'm very proud to highlight, and I hope you don't mind, Peter, but P Professor Peter Shergold is an independent director of CAUSE, and he adds the depth and diversity of thought which happens in our organisation. We're very pleased to support the Menzies uh, Research Centre. Uh, Tom, we're tremendously uh, enthusiastic and happy, very happy to talk about the 12th spot. Uh, again, welcome. Uh, thank you, Tom. I hope you find the discussion as stimulating as I'm sure I will. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Um, the role of government in the third sector in empowering local communities and providing services has been a key focus of our centre. Last year, we hosted Ian Duncan Smith, the UK Secretary of State for Work and Pensions and founder of the UK Centre for Social Justice, who delivered the second John Howard Lecture entitled Welfare Reform, Investing in Life Change. Earlier this year, we were the host to the major coalition policy announcement by Kevin Andrews on empowering civil society, in which he recognised the importance of institutions of community in sustaining democracy itself and committed the coalition to encouraging and protecting the independence and volunteering ethos of the sector rather than seeking to control or direct it. Today's event is an important opportunity to examine the role of governments in the third sector in empowering individuals and families to shape their own futures. In the UK, the Cameron Coalition has embarked on building the big society. In his Liverpool address in July 2010, David Cameron defined the big society thus. The big society is about a huge cultural change where people in their everyday lives, in their homes, in their neighbourhoods, in their workplace, don't always turn to officials, local authorities or central governments for answers to the problems they face, but instead feel both free and powerful enough to help themselves and their own communities. Two years on, we're delighted to have with us today one of the Cameron government's advisers on big society, Philip Blonde, to discuss the practicalities of achieving this objective. And to ensure we can focus specifically on the practical considerations for Australia, Philip will be introduced and joined in discussion by Professor Peter Shergold. Peter's Chancellor of the University of Western Sydney. He was, of course, Australia's most senior civil servant. He served as Secretary of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet for five years, as well as in various uh, positions as head of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission, Secretary of the Department of Education, Science and Training, and Department of Employment. Um, in 2005, Peter was elected a Fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences in Australia. He's also a Fellow of the Australian and New Zealand School of Government and the Institute of Public Administration. He serves on the boards of the National Centre for Indigenous Excellence, the Sir John Monash Foundation, as has been already mentioned, CAUSE, and AMP. He also chairs the board of the National Centre for Vocational Education Research, has headed the Ministerial Expert Group on Gambling, was recently appointed as chair of the New South Wales Public Service Board, and in June this year he was appointed to chair the Australian Government's Aged Care Reform Implementation Council. Peter, I'm staggered you're even free for breakfast. <laughs> 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 Ladies and gentlemen, Peter Shergold. Well, thank you very much indeed for all that uh, long introduction, which I appreciate. I am Peter Shergold. I am uh, delighted that I'm going to have the opportunity to introduce and question our guest this morning. And then, of course, I will throw it across to you to ask questions. It will be useful when you ask questions if you would quickly identify yourself and then avoid at all, on all bases uh, making long comments, if you will, and get straight to the, uh, the question. So, um, as I say, I'm delighted to have this chance to formally interview uh, Philip. It's not something you normally get the chance to do. He is someone, and I'm sure he knows this, whose uh, provocative ideas I very much admire. Now, one thing that may not stand out on his CV, but I will highlight, is that Philip went to Hull University. I say that because I went to the same university. <laughs> <laughs> the bad news is that I went to the university 
the year Philip was born. <laughs> um, he took a, uh, a degree in politics and philosophy, and then for a while you were a lecturer, I think, in philosophy, an Anglican theologian. But then what happened was, I think, the subversive nature of Philip's ideas um, led him out of the constraints of academic life. He became director of the uh, Progressive uh, Conservatism Project at the London-based think tank Demos. And when he found that too confining, I think in 2009, Philip, uh, you decided to set up your own think tank, uh, Res Publica. And that was the year 2009, when I think quite a lot of the people in this room already know that Philip wrote that... Uh, very stimulating, challenging essay, which in 2010 became a book, uh, Red Tory. Subtitle, How Left and Right Have Broken Britain and How We Can Fix It. Uh, since then, of course, he's continued to write very widely, very persuasively, on how to renew political idealism, on the importance of civil association, and I'm delighted that there are so many... Uh, representatives of civil associations in here today, and on how to re-stimulate participatory democracy, which is something that's uh, very central to my thinking. He's now recognised internationally as a political thinker. He's a frequent broadcaster. He's a distinctive voice between, in the sort of social media digerati. And thankfully, thankfully, he is an occasional visitor to Australia and the... Uh, Menzies Research Centre is delighted that we can host him for this uh, function. So, Philip, welcome. Thank now, you very much. Earlier this week, after your appearance on Q&A, I was doing my daily reading of the Drum website, and on it I found an article which, amongst other things, talked about the growing poverty and proletarianisation of people in the West, and argued that capitalism has become the force for a new serfdom. Okay, I thought, here goes the ABC yet again, Don. I thought, you know, here, here's obviously the giving voice to the Wall Street movement and the uh, attacking the 1%. And then, of course, I found, it's your bloody article. <laughs> so, what's this all about? Well, goodness. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> um, hello, and uh, can I just say at the outset, I, I'm overwhelmed uh, by the generosity, hospitality, and sheer, I don't know how to put it really, uh, sheer civilization of, of uh, but it feels like that, to be honest. It really does. The sheer, of, of Australia and what you've achieved and, and the welcome you've been kind enough uh, to give me. So it's very humbling. But to answer your question and to cut to the chase, what's interesting, if you read Hayek's The Road to Serfdom, Hayek outlined a vision of capitalism that I believe in. And his vision of capitalism was one of a pluralisation of power, the multiplication of centres of agency, of ownership, of entrepreneurship, a genuinely free society in which multiple centres articulate differential visions, and as a result we have both liberty and prosperity. Well, I'm sold on that, you know, absolutely. But that's not what we have created. And the figure that was in the article, which if you don't mind, I'll quote again. In 1974, the top 1% of US families had just under 9% of US GDP. I mean, I wouldn't mind that. That would be kind of a win for me. Um, by 2007, the top 1% of US families had 23.5% of US GDP. And if you draw a graph, and roughly from the 1970s to now, uh, the rise of America, it's, rough, it's 45 degree angles. And if you draw across that graph, the return to wages from it, male wages do this. All wages essentially stagnate and slightly incline downwards. And female wages rise and then plateau. Now, what I want to suggest is this is problematic. It's problematic because we're creating a Marxist situation. What is a Marxist situation? <laughs> People who do not own and who rely purely on their wage labour. And this is peculiar because this situation has in many ways been uh, argued for and achieved by the right. 
And what worries me about these trends is when we produce a form of capitalism which doesn't raise all boats, in which we don't create a property class, or if we do create a property class, it's only in one property, and therefore we inflate an asset bubble that when it bursts, converts an asset to a liability. What we do is create a form of capitalism that only works for fewer and fewer people. And history tells us that if we create an economics like that, the outcome of that is not a renewed conservatism. The outcome of that is a renewed constituency for state socialism. So it seems to me odd that, in essence, the right is creating the conditions for its overthrow. And I think that, that particularly in Europe and particularly in the United Kingdom and the United States, this narrative is, is I think, now widely accepted across uh, the political spectrum. It, Fukuyama, I think, in a fantastic essay in Foreign Affairs, said that the type of capitalism that we're now creating threatens the basis of liberal democracy itself. And what worries me is we're creating not just oligopoly, but oligarchs, and, and, and ruled by either, a, in a better sense, a plutocracy, but really an oligarchy in the West. And that mirrors the, the rule by oligarchy in the East. And so the the political purchase of everything we all believe in, free markets, ownership, start to lose their purchase when it looks very much like a Russian or a Chinese type situation. And since I believe in the West, and I believe in the Christian foundation of the West, and I believe quite profoundly in the Western legacy, this to me is a worry. <laughs> but, but for Philip, you could have done all that, mm. and you could have seen this problem, mm. and then you could have become a modern version of a Christian socialist. Mm. I presume that would have been, for most people, I think, the route they would have looked at. They would have said, well, yes, we identify this problem. The way we need mm. to solve it, of course, is by greater levels of state intervention to redistribute, in various ways, the wealth of society. Well, you're right, of course. That's the route most people go. But for me, the, the state is also an agent of proletarianization. Um, because for me, redistribution can never ca catch up with wealth creation. And if you f create a society that attempts to achieve equity through state redistribution, all you do is you create another unelected bureaucracy that is incredibly powerful, that is staffed by an elite. And you attach people to a form of welfare. And for me, welfare is a form of permanent dependence. And once you el enter welfare, you lose agency, you lose ownership, and you lose the ability to join the propertied classes, which is the foundation of liberty. So, so for me, sort of the, in, in a way, I, I think capitalism can be more easily corrected. And I think the state is, is more of a problem. Because, because, I mean, in Australia, I think the figure is 53% of, of Australian households now receive some form of welfare entitlement. That's a similar figure to the United States. And once the middle class becomes hooked on welfare, it becomes, almost, it becomes pretty difficult politically to remove it. But what does welfare do that's wrong? What welfare does that's wrong is it, it isolates people from their community, it creates one-way rights entitlement, and it creates all manner of uh, marginal tax rates when you move off it into something else that in effect traps people in it. And this is something that we now readily accept for the bottom 20 or 30 percent. But I suggest with the changes in capitalism, this will now become true for middle class people as well. And indeed, what's happened is that middle class life is no longer sustainable in many parts of the West without a form of welfare. And then you're in a situation where you need to raise taxes to maintain welfare. And you need to maintain welfare, so you need to raise taxes. And you create uh, an unvirtuous circle that gradually eliminates the capital basis for prosperity. And so for me, the state is a very poor means to make up for inequity. In fact, the state never makes up for inequity. Pe Broadly, broadly put, the left, the left was set up to solve poverty, and it's failed. The left has not used the state outside of small, certain countries that actually, in Scandinavia, for example, that draw on civic wealth, and indeed in large countries like yourself, or large countries like yourself that draw on an earlier civic settlement. Outside of that, in the contested big economies, the state cannot solve poverty. What I believe can solve poverty is a new agenda for a new form of popular mass capitalism, where the middle classes don't go for welfare in order to sustain themselves, but they go for ownership, trade, exchange, market entry, and create a new form of agency. Now, what's happily, what I think is now, is modern technology now makes this possible. Um, modern technology, for the first time, now enables you to globalize 
your own individual trade. Um, eBay, as, as you'll know if you've heard me speak about this, is one of my favorite examples. It actually, for the first time, gives access to individual traders to a global market on the basis of what? A medieval concept called reputation. And reputation now becomes a permission for market entry. And I think this will become more and more the case as, as, as access to the internet will be access to the market and reputation will be aggregated to, to give you permission or not for market entry. But the, the fundamental point I want to suggest, and, and I'd be interested in your thoughts, is if we're going to create a society where genuinely people prosper, we have to create people's capitalism. Now, one of your great achievements in Australia is through superannuation, through how you've used superannuation and, and the sophisticated way in which you started at Can 3%. I say this is music to the yeah. ears to AMP? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but what you've done, what you've done is you've created an ownership class that can then use that, that resource for a variety of different things. And obviously we all, I'm sure here, think that it just going into residential housing is a mistake. Mm. And I've been talking with colleagues about the ways in which one could use superannuation to do other forms of trade that are also asset generating. But that is the sort of politics that I'm trying to talk about. If we're a democracy and if we're the West, we cannot have a situation in which the price of losing is essentially the recreation of caste. And in, in my country, you don't just have class, you have caste. And caste yeah. is a class-based position you cannot escape from. And actually, the, high, the societies with the highest rate of social immobility uh, in an OECD survey in 2010 was the United Kingdom, followed by Italy, but that's for different reasons, because southern Italy is a bit of a basket case, and, uh, and the United States. And so I want a radical transform... I want to fulfill Hayek's vision. I want to fulfill the vision of, that's in, in Menzies' speech. I want to fulfill the vision of an independent uh, property trading class that because it has that, it has the, uh, its resources to both save itself and save its community. But the form of capitalism that we're practicing will ensure a socialist resolution. And, that's, that, and I don't believe the state can become the force for equalizing that outcome. But the trouble is, is if you're a waged worker, if you're a person who has no other state, you will vote for that. And, and you would not be irrational to do so. Now, you called yourself a Red Tory, and I think we've done a pretty good job, you've done a very good job over the last ten minutes about saying the broad elements of what that means. I don't think anybody ever calls themselves a guru, but you have been called the philosophical guru of big society. So is that how you see yourself? Now, I always avoid the term guru because it always reminds me of people like R.D. Lang who are completely unbearable. Um, <laughs> so, so, you know, and, and as soon as you're a guru, then the press attacks you and it's just all a bit odd. Um, um, so I've, I've tried to avoid that. But the answer is, is what do we, how do we proceed? Now, I'm a conservative and I believe conservatism is pro-poor. Now, you say that to the majority, to certain populations in... They would laugh at you if you said that. But I, I'm, I'm with Chamberlain. I'm with uh, Ruskin from the 19th century. I'm with, in a sense, the spirit of Thatcher, not the realisation of Thatcher, and the spirit of Reagan, but not the realisation of Reagan, which is we want to create the conditions where all can, all can do well. So here's the question. If the problem is that um, people are not participating in capitalism, why? And if the answer to that is they don't own anything and they also don't have the structures of association, then certain approaches come to bear. And actually in Britain, what I noticed is also that our society, particularly for those at the bottom, is completely shattered. Um, broadly speaking, in the 1960s, uh, the left made war on the family as the site of the, the bourgeois oppression of women. It made war on relationships. And in, in many ways, the form of libertarianism that the left followed, um, actually the left made war on society, and it won. And as a result, all forms of settled relationship, all forms of commitment, all forms of reciprocity were viewed as an illegitimate limit upon personal freedom, upon personal will, and on volition. And that destruction of life at the bottom of society, in a way, is what removed from the poor the last bulwark of their defence. If you go into Europe, you can be poor, but you're not destroyed in certain areas. In some areas you are. But in areas that preserve what are viewed as outdated values, they still have 
what one might call a horizontal economy. They still look after each other. They still have networks. You go to countries that have benefited from this magnificent social revolution. They're isolated. They're alone. They're fractured. Their neighbors steal off them. Their neighbors threaten them physically. The, um, the condition of life for these people is akin to a benighted caste. And it's passed on to their children and their children's children. So if this is the problem, then what's the solution? So just to sum up, the problem is complete social collapse and corruption and, and complete impoverishment, complete decapitalization. So I thought, well, what do you do? You can't just have the same old starry rhetoric about pull up your socks, you know, work hard. That's rubbish. That's not going to transform them. That's just offering, say, low-paid work forever. That's not what I, as a radical conservative, believe in. And you can't just give them <clears throat> kind of a moralism because they're not in a condition where they can even utilize that. So I thought you have to restore political economy and community at the same time. How do you do that? Well, very simply. What do most, what's the income of most people who are poor? It's from the state. What does the state do? It isolates, it segregates, it standardizes. What is that? The death of community and the death of service. Beginning from the top, if you, if you, one of the things that's wrong with state services, this is all founded on the French revolutionary ideas, that everybody, that everything should be the same for everybody. But the trouble is with universalized, standardized services, is actually that means nobody gets what they want and nobody gets what they need. Now that's fine if you're rich or if you're wealthy or if you're well positioned or lucky, but it's death if you're poor, not that bright and in trouble. So what, so standardization doesn't serve the poor, it creates a postcode lottery, which as you know in England we have, we have life expectancy by varying from up, up to 30 years. That's kind of quite a big variation for an advanced country. So what I thought is, we need localized services. Okay, because localized services can meet the needs of the people in that district. But how can we get those services not being administered by middle class people who have a certain contempt for the people they serve, but also more importantly the problem of comorbidity? Because when people are in trouble, they have many problems, not just one. That's a health term, you know, you're, if you're ill, you're ill in a number of different ways. And government services are almost always in separate silos. And they intervene at different points, at different stages, and they're not very effective because it's not holistic. And I thought, well, let's group those services together. Let citizens organize to take over the state. So one of my most kind of transformative ideas for me, not necessarily for anyone else, of course, um, was what if citizens come together as a civic group and can take over and group the money spent on them? Then they are, for the first time, capitalized, and they're capitalized by income from the state, and they're formed in a group. So, for instance, if you're in an estate and poverty groups in British cities in estates and it's beset by youth crime and gangs, the people there who want to make a difference will be the unmarried mothers who don't want their children to fall in that. If you can form a society or an association with them, and if you can give them economic power, you also give them political power. And then they can author the shape and nature of their estate from the bottom up. And that sense, that sort of was the breakthrough moment for me of, that's, that's the move. That's the move, is to use the state to capitalize the poor. Now, you'll know this from your own services. Certain people get on certain state supplements, and you know they'll have them for 20 years. So in Britain, housing benefit, for example, you know certain families will be on it for 20 years. And that income stream is probably paid for the original property three times over, and there's no benefit to the tenant, and there's no benefit to the government. What if we could capitalize or front load these sorts of benefits such that they were transformative and people were able to balance themselves out of the situation? As I think I said earlier uh, at a meeting Kevin was at, think of child benefit, which is a universal benefit, very small amounts a week for like almost 18 years. What if we could front load that, give that to the mother, and she could, do, she could become educated? It would give her a far greater uh, earning power and deliver far more to the family. So the whole thought, the first thought about the big society is recapitalize the poor, recapitalization. Then the second thought about big society is grouping. In, in everything you do, try to create an intermediate group because individuals are isolated and individuals alone against the state can do nothing. Now what's exciting about big society is it's not just for the poor. <laughs> if it was, it would be dismissed. What it becomes is the type of way you succeed in life and you engender all sorts of positive things. Think of pensions, I know it's close to your heart, or super as you call it. 
if you self-associate, if you can come together in a group and form a group that actually eliminates the compounded effect of management charges over a 25-year period, in Britain, your pensions can be 30 to 40% higher at the end uh, of, of your working life. Now, if you tried to fund that directly through government taxation, God knows what that figure would be. The mere fact of association can increase your pension pot for middle-class people by that amount. So what we've done, and what I suspect, is actually this is the key to a 21st century future. It's all about association and using association to leverage out the costs of bureaucracy. And remember, in respect of the state, 20% of every... Every, of a part of every frontline budget is, is absorbed by each management layer it moves down. So radical devolution. Now I hate to talk about the Olympics, so I, I apologise. I only do this because the facts force me into it. Um, <laughs> one of the reasons for British success is that we didn't have a standardised centre <laughs> that then apportioned money. What we did is, as we said, let money and culture go together. So we pushed individual budgets out to groups, and we said, you determine how it's spent, and you determine the culture. And so what they did, and we know this from countless things, money is more effective the closer to the source where it's spent. But what we never talk about is ethos. And what happened is that devolution and the rise of ethos enabled small groups to outcompete everybody else in the world. So what I want to suggest to you is this isn't just a nice speech about those who aren't successful. This, I hope, is a speech about what the conditions of success look like for the 21st century. And one of the lessons, I think, is networks outcompete almost everything else. Almost everything else. And if we can utilise networks and capitalism, we can create forms of success that will actually be distributive. Because I don't believe in redistribution, but I do believe in distribution. And we can use these as distributive effects for capitalism. So distribute not just capital, because then you can't distribute capital without capacity. But if you distribute capital in a way that engenders capacity, then you can start to create agency. Now let me, I was very interested in the British Industrial Revolution. I was very interested in why it happened in Britain and didn't happen elsewhere. And there were three factors for why Britain um, um, became the source of the Industrial Revolution. The first factor is a wide decentralising of capital. Capital wasn't centralised, it was decentralised. Lots of different cities, that's why we have the, the city-states of the 18th and 19th centuries, lots of cities had their own source of capital. Now, allied with that source of capital, there were also huge uh, numbers of local inventors or innovators who came together in clubs. So you had clubs of investors with capital, with clubs of uh, inventors. And linking them all up was the periodical system of the publications and science publications that told them they'd done something silly in Germany and it hadn't worked, so we certainly wouldn't do that in Britain. And that came together, and people innovated on a localised basis and produced mass innovation in towns that have become famous the world over, but they're essentially just little backwaters. Now, what I, I was very interested in the report by McKinsey yesterday on Australia's uh, lack of production uh, in terms of lack of productivity. Now, what I suggest to you is what I'm talking about, actually, this is the conditions for a form of capitalism that links up everything we want. And the type of capitalism we have now doesn't descend to capital. It pulls capitalism to the centre. It's underpinned by implicit guarantees. We privilege certain investment models and, and penalise others. Capitalism in our Western model doesn't decenter. It doesn't do that. It groups, it aggregates, and it concentrates. And that, I think, is one of the most worrying aspects of uh, the dispensation. Hang on, hang on for a minute. You've got to reconnect. Oh, sorry, because I'm talking without. Okay, you were talking without a microphone, so I'll now talk. This is an opportunity to, to say, look, uh, that's, that's very well, Philip. And, and the good news is that a lot of the ideas that you have talked about that we recognise in big society are clearly being picked up here. Yep. Kevin Andrew has written very persuasively, I think, on um, the importance of association, of civil uh, society, of citizen empowerment. Sure. Tony Abbott, not just by what he says, by what he does, has clearly gone out there and exhibited here the importance of volunteering, of, uh, of self-reliance, uh, of, of localism. So the ideas are being picked up. But... 
although I did leave England 40 years ago, I'm still in touch with my nephews and nieces. And I think at first they thought this big society might be okay. What they tell me now is that it's uh, just a veneer. That really all this is, is really a cloak for reducing public expenditure and cutting back services. So presumably, I suspect that's how lots of people in the UK are seeing it at the moment. Yeah, I mean, the big, big society has been very successfully smeared. And, and what I always say on British telly is the big society has lost every single battle, but it's already won the war. And, and what I mean by that is that, nonetheless, implicitly, everybody knows this is the way to go. And one evidence of, or evidence of that is the Labour Party has, un, has not said it will appear, repeal any of the big society legislation. In fact, John Crudus, who's head of ideology, I guess, uh, or policy rather, uh, has, has said, actually, we're going to, we like the big society, we just don't think it can function without the state. And in that sense, big society has mainstreamed and the left are seeking to innovate over it. In that sense, also, what I think has gone wrong in the United Kingdom, and obviously this is just all between us, um, <laughs> is, that, is that the Conservative Party in the United Kingdom have not made a decision about what type of Conservatives they are. And what that means is, because they, you have to govern, in crisis, you have to govern by principle. If, it, if you're in a growth situation, it's fine, you can be pragmatic, but in a crisis, and we are in a crisis, you have to govern by principle. And what the Conservative Party has done is let all the dogs roam, almost let a competition within itself as to what principles it, it, uh, it inculcates or encapsulates. This has been a disaster because what it means is that some policy is run in a big society way, other is run is it from the 1980s, from the 1990s. And it's allowed conservatism to essentially retoxify itself. Because if conservatism is essentially just about deficit cutting, just about austerity, well, that's not enough to win a majority anywhere, actually. And that's what they've allowed to happen. And what's really worrying is the type of cutting we're doing isn't even smart cutting. It's just salami sliced or just cutting. And you had the unseemly um, reality of massive cat cuts to the local government budget before the localism bill had passed, which would allow citizens to take over entities and run them more effectively. Let me give you one example of why I think big society and austerity, though big society has, doesn't mean anything to do with austerity, but does mean a more effective way to run the state. It does mean a more productive way to run the state. Let me give you um, 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 one example. Sanwell, which is a council in the West Midlands, uh, um, spun out its uh, adult and social care uh, division. This is looking after vulnerable adults with either mental illnesses or medical problems. Um, and then they did an audit of what happened to the spin-out. Now, the spin-out, when I say spin-out, they made part of their public service a mutual, a cooperative. And a lot of my work has been telling conservatives that cooperatives or mutualisation is actually part of what should be their agenda. After all, the Rochdale pioneers were not a socialist organisation, much as people try to claim they were. In fact, they were, many of them were conservatives, a conservative trade association. Now, one of the things I first, my first policy intervention um, in this new career I had was arguing for spin-outs of the state, to break up the state so that <coughs> state services became mutuals and cooperatives. You create uh, bureaucrats, become business owners, and they start to run things more efficiently. So anyway, this is what they did in Sandwell. And uh, the council did an audit, and it looked back, and it found out that in-house care to look after an adult was £658 per person per week. For the cooperative that had spun out, it was £328 per person per week. And that's quite interesting, because the standard response would be, oh, you must have slashed pensions, you must have you know, cut staff wages, it must have been awful. Quite the reverse. Pensions were maintained, but what did fall were the following. Sick days per st employee per year fell from 22 days in the council to 0.3 days. And, and expenditure uh, on the front line increased from the low 60s to the mid 80s. You got a much more efficient service. Staff morale soared and patient satisfaction 
rose in a similar fashion. And that's what the big society is about, creating uh, ownership, mutuality. And indeed, and why I think big society isn't restricted to the state but is the future for the private sector, um, employee-owned companies outcompeted the top 100, FTSE 100 every year over the last decade by 10% on a profit basis. The General Accounting Office in the United States, this is to speak to McKinsey's report yesterday, did a, sur a survey of employee-owned or employee-directed companies, and they found that the productivity gain was 58%. I don't believe that myself, that seems far too high, but nonetheless, that's what they concluded. So what I'm trying to tell you is this isn't a kitsch. I mean, I have all the, the errors of a true convert, um, so uh, apologies for that. Well, no, let me just ask you, yeah. it was a true, true mm. convert, I mean... Let's imagine, well, let's imagine you had the chance to introduce big society in 2005. Or no, that's been more provoked. Let's imagine you got the chance to introduce big society in Australia, mm. where, you know, obviously economic conditions are better, mm. although all governments are moving towards balancing budgets and mm. austerity. Nevertheless, there are greater freedoms. Do you think it would be easier to introduce it here? To, to be honest with you, I think, I think in some sense it would. Because here you have surplus, and here you have not, obviously I know some governments are in deficit and you're seeking to reduce the surplus, but what it would enable is the type of investment that's needed and the patience that's needed to fully realise it. But actually the productivity gains uh, from what I'm talking about are literally massive. I just gave you an example, yeah. and the returns are much greater. And what I, I like about, for instance, the Liberal Party's approach and what Tony Abbott's talked about, is you're retain, you want to get surplus so you can do more good. It's not just a dry agenda. You want to create the conditions so you can do all manner of, uh, of investment. And I think, I think what's interesting in Australia, and, and you saw on Q&A, people said, oh, we already have big society here. I mean, it's always the response. It's a type of smug contentment that there's no need to innovate and, and we have that in Britain but if you look at what's happening in uh, indigenous territories in Australia it's terrifying the rate of incarceration of, ab uh, of Aboriginal peoples is up I think between 2000 and 2008 by about 35 percent in 2000 incarcerate Aborigines were 13 uh, times more likely to be incarcerated and that's in the year 2000 in 2008 it rose to 17 times so there are canaries in the coal mine in, in your own. And Absolutely. I mean, the most frightening thing, I, statistic I came across is that from, you know, nearly 26% of your young people aged 16 to 22 have uh, reports of mental health problem. And you find this also across Europe. It's, now, for me, what's interesting is, is that's actually correlated to social breakdown and to family breakdown and to inability to create the right conditions for young people to flourish. So my sense is, is that, you know, you've got massive assets about to, to sort of be sold off. And I had a wonderful meeting with very gifted people at um, New South Wales in your, in your state government yesterday. And there's a sense in which you, can, you, you should keep what you've won, which is superannuation, but you should radicalise it and extend it to everything else. You should look to create that in almost everything you do elsewhere. And also, your charitable sector and your social enterprise sector is really labouring under an apprehension that it's not needed or it's not necessary or that in some sense it's, it's an addendum to a society that's actually doing well. But you could do so much. Think of the unco uncontactable sums that are in your superannuation fund. The estimates that I've read put it at something like 12 billion. I'm not sure how, how correct that is. But the point is, is we start a big society capital with 600 million. And that's going to revolutionise the support for, to the charitable and, so, and, and welfare sector. And get that to be an agency that can deliver uh, for the state in a way that the state could never deliver for the state. And if we could use some of those uncontactable funds in, in the superannuation <coughs> funds, you could renew the Australian social compact and extend it. And then you will continue to be the lucky country. And you all know you have to work at your luck. And, and what I think is amazing is Australia is a beacon for what can be achieved. And Australia has traded upon a common consensus that's there in Menzies' Forgotten People, that was there in Hawke, there in Keating. When Keating linked labour to productivity, that was 
a great revolution, I think. And so what I'm arguing for is, is build on that and extend it. Okay, well, that's a very good point, I think, to start to take some questions from the floor. Where, who would like to ask first? Yes, back on that table, and I'll gradually move forward. Hello, Andrew Perry is my name. I'm a lawyer and technologist. Um, just like to pick up on the... Um, oh, sorry. Uh, Andrew Perry, I'm a lawyer and technologist. Um, I'd like to pick up on, you touched on technology, and um, my passion is looking at Facebook and seeing that there's now this community out there where the developers of Facebook are the constitutional lawyers of the 21st century. They're the ones that write the rules as to how we can interact. Um, there's no separation of law, um, you know, in terms of executive power, etc. So I left big law firms to start building online communities with this in mind. I see uh, in terms of the big society that you talk about where capital is distributed, open source software, the freely available software that you can download to run the internet to build these micro businesses is a really powerful way of distributing capital because that software is a fundamental building block of the new economy. So have you thought about the role that open source software can have in big society and the role that government should have in I guess uh, developing systems in an open way using open source software that local communities can then download and use it for their own purpose. Got it. I think, I think you, you put your finger on a very interesting point. Technology has been antisocial almost since the 50s <coughs> to relatively recently. Putnam's work, television is almost, you know, it's not just the government that destroys families, it's TV. You know, TV isolates, segregates, makes, ensures people don't eat together which is very crucial. It's not accidental that every human society involves the hospitality and eating together. It's obviously pretty primary. But technology has turned pro-social. And that's the most interesting thing to develop. And now, now society is pursued on the internet. And that's why I think there's a huge well of idealism that actually should be drawn on. And when people have virtual community, they want actual community. And the, the task for me in terms of technology, if I may slightly bend your question, is we now have the conditions for localism. How do we actuate it? And actually the hyperlocal, and I know Australia's got a lot of remote communities, in Britain hyperlocal websites get 90% penetration in terms of their communities. That means 90% of people who live in their vicinity use it. So for the first time, they have the conditions to interact. So your point about open source is it's out there and can be easily done. I have other concerns about open source is because I think people need a return for their labor and people need a return for their IP. So I think we haven't got the balance yet in public procurement or anywhere else between the fact we do need to pay for some things, otherwise those things won't get done, and open source. So I think that's the interesting discussion we can have. But your point is well made. You can reconnect communities far more cheaply. You don't need to hire 28 workers to go out and say, why don't you talk to each other? You just can have one website that connects them. And that's the point I think I, we're in agreement on. Thank you. We're going to come to this question here. The one thing I might add to that is I think it's absolutely vital that governments that are collecting data using public funds to the largest extent possible make that data available, open source, creative commons, so that people at the community level can use it just as they want to. Yeah. Completely. Now, believe it or not, my name is actually James Bond. Uh, <laughs> you might be another brother. <laughs> well, you have to have a drink. <laughs> well, uh, uh, I don't work for MI6. I'm actually a very boring economist, but I am from Queanbeyan, where George Lazenby is also from. Uh, I work for the Financial Services Council, where, uh, which represents retail superannuation funds. I'm also president of the Australian Services Roundtable. So I was interested, when you were talking about, um, about people's capitalism, superannuation automatically came to mind, and you talked about it a lot. Now, it's $1.3 trillion, that's larger than the stock capitalisation of the stock market, soon to be $3 trillion by 2020, $5 trillion by 2050, um, uh, by 20, 2030. Uh, you talked about maybe changing the investment, with the, how, how it's invest, invested, and the, common, uh, the, the current thinking is, the current uh, view is that it should allow the market to decide how it's invested. Do you have a view about how... Um, superannuation funds should be changed if you, if you want well, to implement it. Here's my, here's my response to that. Here we have a huge source of capital, but what are the other problems in the economy? You've got a sense that housing is moving out of people's reach. You've got a situation where young people can't get on the housing ladder. And we're starting to create a tension, an intergenerational tension that you see elsewhere. And that's very worrying and, and problematic because that starts to leverage in 
to other forms of dysfunction. I'm always struck by what Singapore allows, which is that you can withdraw from superannuation to fund types of activities that are also capital enhancing, like education or like house purchase. Now, if I say this to any superannuation professional, they, go, they get very angry indeed. Um, and perhaps with merit, you know, don't disturb a system that works really, really well. But I tend to think at every point you've got to think, how do I pluralise capital, not how do I concentrate it? And, and so I think there is room, I think, to explore ways in which superannuation might either be drawn down or front-loaded, and the incentives, the tax incentives that accrue to super accrue also to that drawdown. And I just think, you know, because for instance, what's the most crucial thing now for a population? The most crucial thing for a population is, is education. We now compete as a country on medium education levels. How do we run our education? We only educate the young and we essentially say education stops past 22. This is insane. What we have to do is actually have through life education. I'm about to propose in Britain um, uh, uh, essentially a through life degree that you take at different stages. Because what's also true is you, you, you become educated and then you go off into an entirely different area and you never really catch up to the same degree level of education in your profession. This is wrong. I think superannuation should also be allowed to draw down or be a source or a guarantee for through life education and for through life training. And I think if you do that, you ensure that education, which is also an asset, becomes something that's endowed throughout the future. And I just think we need creative thinking on this. One that doesn't kill the golden goose, but one that extends its benefit. Very good. Yes, on this table Sorry. here. I'll work around the tables. Yep. Sure. Uh, my name's Trevor Rowe, and I'm just a poor old investment banker. So, oh! Uh, so what do I know? <laughs> but one of the things that fascinates me with your commentary is that we live in an increasingly politicised economy that I think That's narrows true. choices, redirects resources inappropriately, and doesn't allow for the disbursement of, it, of power and decision-making that is the root of part of our problem. Isn't this a phenomenon that we're seeing all over the Western world, this politicization of our economy? I think that's a very interesting point, and it's never occurred to me before, and I thank you for it. And my immediate sort of reaction is, you're right. Um, but I think you politicize when you're in a situation of inequity. See, I'm not an egalitarian. I don't believe in equality. But I do believe in equity, and, and roughly spoke, equity for me is what you get out, you put in, right? And, and, in, and most human beings operate like that. Human anthropology is like that. And one of the interesting things, I think, is there's companies like Semco in Brazil where they have people's wages on the wall, and they have to publicly defend their wage levels at a meeting. You know, people, companies like Gore-Tex elect their managers. And the point is, is that's a politicization that works that's linked to productivity, that is democratic. The corrupting form of politicization that you're talking about is when people feel the differentials aren't just, when people feel the differentials work against them. Now, I believe in differentials, but I think they need now to be democratically um, um, defended. I mean, I actually think the future of capitalism will be very different. I think soon nations will become trading platforms where you have to have ethical permission to enter. And if you're, if you're a freeloader in the sense that you game or you're seen by the community to game uh, the nation or the country, you won't be let in. And I think in terms of tax rates and tax demands, this is where it's going to go. And in about 20 years, business will have to be ethical if it wants to trade because it needs that sort of public account of its rewards in order to get permission to, to, to enter the market. Yes, Lisa. Thank you. I'm Lisa George. I'm the head of the Macquarie Group Foundation. So interested in the community sector um, and your thoughts on, obviously, the, the community sector is about 75% in Australia funded by government. So your argument about big society presumably means that that funding would come down, and it's how a lot of community services are delivered. What's the alternative? Where, where else does capital come for, from for, for this sector to, to thrive and to do what it, what it does? Thank you. It's a very good question. Um, one of the interesting things about the big society is you had all these charities that are essentially reliant on government grants. And so in some sense, they're not charities. In the, in, in the sense, they're just agencies of the central government. 
Of course I believe in philanthropy, of course I believe in people giving more, but that's not really a radical answer. The radical answer for me is um, the following. Um, in Britain, prisoner rehabilitation has failed. Um, when people uh, leave prison, within three years, si roughly 66% of them will be reconvicted. And that's just the ones we know about. You know, there's probably rates of offending will be higher than rates of conviction. So hugely expensive for the state in terms of incarceration, detection, uh, processing through the legal system. And that leaves out the damage these people do. If you get a social enterprise or a charity, often faith-based, to actually look after people when they come out of prisons, the reconviction rate dramatically falls. Shockingly falls. Unprecedented falls. In some cases, the industry norm is 15% reconviction. So if the state looks after you in terms of rehabilitation, 66%, which probably means 85. If, if social enterprise and local or community groups look after you, 15%. Now what we've done in Britain is, for the first time, we've created a social impact bond. And that says that these local community groups that deal with ex-offenders, and remember in certain areas, because crime is concentrated, they go back into the community, they cause more trouble, um, is the local groups will, will do the rehabilitation for three years and government will pay those local groups for every point below the detection rate. And in order to fund that three years, they then can go to the private sector and say, look, we've got a contract with blue chip government, if we do X, they'll pay us Y, will you give us Z to fund the interim? And they say yes. And that's a social impact bond. And then what you have is an effective state. Then you have the community policing itself, rather than the state policing the community. And then you have a communal takeover of the state, because the state runs the services that works. Let me give you another example from healthcare. Um, people are non-standard, and lots of people now have very distinct con medical conditions. And what's interesting about standardized service is it can't meet those distinct medical conditions. So if you're a leukemia sufferer or if you have kind of a disease that only a certain number of people have, you never get really specific care. But what we've done in the United Kingdom is we've personalized budgets. We've given people their own budgets or their own voucher, and they said, you, you administer it. And what they then do is they group together. So the leukemia sufferers of Great Britain come together, and they buy block care, and that care is something they've never, ever had before. So what I'm trying to suggest is the community work we do is your problems are a capital asset. And if you can, if you can run a business around your problems, then you can use the community to take over the state and to genuinely solve its problems. Sorry, Philip, please, no, no, the good news oh, here is yeah. that in New South Wales, the O'Farrell government mm. is in fact introducing what is calling social benefit bonds, and the two areas it's examining are how to use social enterprises in terms of dealing with out-of-home foster care and prison of recidivism. So it's starting to happen. Question. Philip, um, Philip um, I'll speak without it. Um, I'm Paul Espy. I'm a Stanley's director and um, I'm a fund manager of sorts in the, in the Bank of Our background. Thank you. Um, a question I'd like to drill in a bit to the an early part of your thesis, which is that um, we should localise and group and and communise almost, using a bad term, um, services. And um, we, we actually live in a society where um, the the problem perhaps starts right at the beginning, where uh, we presently um, we we are presently electing people to office who are promising to spend a lot of money. And it's as though the money tree exists somewhere. And so there's a start to it all. And then it cascades down into a dependent mentality. And you're quoting figures in excess of 50% of our society with a degree of, of dependency. Now, um, if you succeed in localizing some of the activities that you're talking about, um, it seems at first cut that one of, one of the benefits is that you can potentially get rid of some of your overheads. Uh, you can take the centre and all the bureaucrats out of it if you've got a simplistic way of allocating the money. But you've still 
you're still left, are you not, with a dependency mindset. You've got a group, you, you've created a group and a greater efficiency for delivery of service, uh, but you, you're still, there's still a mindset. The money's coming from somewhere else, and there has to be something more, it seems to me, that is production, um, value add, um, economic gain coming out of those groups to compensate uh, and get away from the cash flow dependency. Well, I, th I, think your, I think your analysis is correct, and I think there's two aspects that might help answer the question. If you localise services, it follows that you can localise taxation. Now, I've advocated in Britain uh, pushing, pushing taxation to a much more local level, precisely because I want to see efficiency reflected in lower taxation at the local level. One of the reasons this doesn't work in big countries is people can't hypothecate in their own minds. They can't do it. You've got to align what I pay with what I do much more closely. But the second, the second point is that actually if you create social capital, you create real capital. And what's interesting is, is and you know this from human anthropology, human history, is if you, if you group and people win, they create lots of other wins in lots of other ways. So, for instance, just property values are related to social value. So if, for instance, you create a community that, um, that groups and buys out its, its, its property or its shops or some local infrastructure, if it creates the social capital, then that social capital that stops kids hanging out, that stops criminals, that stops the sense of abandonment that, that you see in so many of our cities, you get massive capital uplift. You get massive capital uplift in property values. The capturing of that can then lead to uh, an asset that can land leverage other businesses. And this is what happens. This is what is already happening in, in communities. You have communities that are coming together. They create one good, and they create lots of other goods. And so this isn't a one-off. What, what this actually does is restore agency, particularly to the poor, and ownership. And once you have agency and ownership, people don't just stop there. They trade up. Very last way. one. I'm, I'm sorry, there are other questions, but I know we've got just, to stick to time. Just trying to break the mindset yep. of, of dependency. Now, that, that's, that's the question. How do you... Ownership. Do you... Yeah. Ownership is how you yeah. break dependency. And giving people the option to trade. That would be my... So thank answer. you for the follow-up. That yeah. was helpful. Look, I do apologise. I've seen at least four other people who want to ask questions, which is shows what a stimulating uh, session it has been. Um, but let me summarise, because um, I feel, having been here 40 years, I think I can now qualify as an Australian, um, say something that maybe Philip is too polite to say. Some of you may, like I, have watched uh, Q&A on Monday. And it was very interesting. There was almost this um, grouping of, um, of Cassandra, Goldie, and Mark... Uh, uh, Mark Butler, Drew Gower to some extent, which was saying, well, all this about big society is, is sort of interesting, but essentially we don't really need it here because Australia is in, a, is in a better position and much of what you're saying, Philip, is already being done here. So let me say, from my perspective, what Philip can't, which is poppycock. Uh, I don't believe that's the case. It is true that Australia has this wonderful, <coughs> raucous cacophony of not-for-profit, 600,000 not-for-profit organisations, 56,000 charities, 50,000 uh, organisations that are of economic significance, 20,000 social enterprises, all of that. And the good news is that they have become far more integral as governments. And to be honest, it was the Howard government that drove a great deal of this by changing a 50-year-old government monopoly, the Commonwealth Employment Service, and creating up a competitive market of public and private and not-for-profit deliverers of, of job network. And today, as you probably know, $26 billion worth of government services are delivered through the not-for-profit sector. So yes, we're doing it. But what we do know is nearly all governments in doing that impose a high level of bureaucratic red tape they essentially try and make these organisations little government agencies and actually crush 
a great deal of the social innovation. So I think we do need to, to learn from that. Um, we still, I think, routinely treat citizens as customers. Now, there's good reasons, because we want to emphasise customer service. But what we lose in that is people don't realise that the rights and the entitlements come with responsibilities and obligations, which gets lost mm. in that concept. Um, we still, as everyone in this know, room knows, struggling with intergenerational welfare dependence because, with the best of intentions, what governments have been doing is treating people as recipients and dependents and then being surprised when they learn helplessness. So that's absolutely, at all jurisdictional levels, an Australian challenge. We're still struggling with how best to support not-for-profit organisations becoming social enterprises able to trade for their mission. So there's a great deal we can learn from Philip's ideas. There's a great deal we can learn from big society, which I think is absolutely of significance both to Commonwealth and state governments. So, Philip, thank you for sharing your ideas. I think everybody here has found it stimulating. We really appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.